It's good. Go ahead. It's okay. It's it's the bottom one on the left hand side. Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful. And sharper than any two edged sword, piercing the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And all scripture is God breathed. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman. He is not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, Steve, uh, take about 15 seconds or so. Close out, our, uh, close out the prayer time and then move right into our Bible study. Father, it is with great... Uh, Anticipation and great excitement. We come to study your word each and every time we do. So we ask your blessings. What is taught here, Father, that we will understand it and believe it and apply it. Yes. Thank you for Dr. Jim, this ministry. I pray that you'll keep the passion teaching us alive and long. We'll ask in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Steve, you have you have to want it, don't you? You have to want it. And once you want it, you got to go get it. And once you get it, you got to understand it, believe it, and then apply it. That's God's plan. Okay, our subject today is just an extension of the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 8. We studied late verse 8 the last time we were together. That would have been on Sunday. But now what we're going to do is we're going to take that verse and we're going to expand it. And interestingly enough, in, in times like we're living right now, the most important thing in your life, but it's not a thing, it's a person. The most important person in your life is Jesus Christ. And it is through him that God's made everything available to us to handle the circumstances like we have uh, right now. I don't know whether, uh, how many of you would have seen the seen and heard the State of the Union message last night, but it was interesting because the problems in our country really weren't dealt with. And uh, but anyway, we, we might have expect, expected something like that. But what we're going to do tonight is going to continue to see the importance of Jesus Christ in our lives. So with that in mind, uh, just want to make one announcement. That is March the 13th is our next a Bible class fellowship luncheon at American Pie Pizza, same time, same place, same agenda, uh, just a different Bible study. So with that in mind, mark your calendars and let me know if you plan to attend. Let's go to our notes now. Now, what I wanna do here to begin with is I, I want to, to read verse seven, seven and eight as as we have studied them already. This is an interpretive translation based upon the fact that what we have done is we've already exegeted this, exposited it, and here it is. Philippians 2, chapter 7. Remember, Paul's in jail. Paul's in Rome. The Philippians are being pressured. Paul says, look, I know where you are. You're, you've grown to spiritual adulthood. You're spiritual self-esteem. But look, the next step you, you've got to take is into spiritual autonomy, no man's land, and he says, I want you to do, do me a favor. He said, I'm already happy because you're, you're mature. He says, but I want you to make my happiness complete. So now he's going to talk about, about Christ himself. And in verse 7, he's speaking of Jesus. And he said, but deprived himself of the proper function of deity. Now, if we're, if we're going to talk about that much of the verse, he deprived himself. Is just a phrase. But until you understand the 10 characteristics of the triune Godhead, remembering that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three persons of the Godhead, and you might, might, might 
need to understand this. We talk about the Trinity, three persons of the Godhead, but you're going to find many people out there who believe there are only two persons of the Godhead, the Father and the Son, and there is no Holy Spirit. Then there's another group that believes that there's only one person of the Godhead, and that's Jesus Christ who's functioning as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I call this uh, the and the Godhead is, is triune. And remembering now that all three persons of the Godhead are co-equal and co-eternal. What does it mean if they're co-eternal? Which one of them was born first? Was that? I said, which one? Always, always were. Oh, so they were not born, they're right? They no, they weren't born, see. They were eternal. There has never been a time when they weren't. Okay, that's so they're they're co-equal and co-eternal. What okay now what about co-equal? What does that mean? What are we what are we focusing on when we talk about co uh co co-equal? They're co-equal and co-eternal. All of the three persons have the same attributes. Just give me a give me an acronym for the the, the ten attributes. Cell junior UI. Now I'm telling you right now. If uh, you need to understand what those are, cell junior UI, the 10 characteristics of the Godhead. Now, what this says is, but he deprived himself of the, of the proper function of his deity. What the proper, if the proper function of his deity, what does that mean? He's not going to use what in his humanity? What isn't he going to use? Deity. No, it, that, no, in his deity, what is he not going to use? See, this is important to you now, and this is not a trick question, but what were we just talking about? Cell junior UI, okay, what are those? Those are, the, those are the characteristics of Godhead. So that's what makes him deity. That what's, that's what makes the, the three persons of the Godhead deity. It is the cell junior UI, sovereignty, eternal life, et cetera, okay? Now, that's his deity. Now, if he is, if he is born as a human being, and now he is... He is combined. He's two persons in one. He's the he is the Son of God. He's he's Christ, but he's also Jesus in his humanity. These two persons are well together. So, what is he going? To, what from from which por, portion portion in life function from his humanity? He's going to function from his humanity. So, if he functions from his humanity. He's going to deprive himself of the proper function of his of his deity. So what that means is, when he gets in a hang up, he gets in a in a in a position where he needs uh, some help, just like you and I. Oh yeah, that's no big deal. Hey, I'm omnipotent. I'll just reach over here to my omnipotence and I'll handle this. No, he won't. That's what it means that in his humanity he faced the battle in life, the temptations. but he did it from his body, soul, and human spirit. He didn't touch his deity at all. So this is why it says here, but he deprived himself of the proper function of his deity. So while he was the God-man in one person forever, what happens then is many people, when you tell them they need to be like Christ, which is what the, goal, what the objective of the Christian way of life is, to become like Christ, you say, okay, well, just a minute, no. Well, he didn't sin. He didn't do this. He wasn't tempted or he didn't fall to temptation. Yeah, but he was Jesus. No, no, no. He he didn't. He deprived. Okay, that is when he, he, he deprived himself of the proper function of deity. When did it happen? It happened when he received the form of a servant although he had been born in the likeness of mankind. Then in verse 8, it says, and this is, that's my phrase, Christ humbles himself. That's the idea in this verse. He said, in fact, although having been discovered in outward appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of spiritual death. That is the spiritual death of the cross. Now, when, when, when you read that verse, and I threw in that phrase spiritual, that word spiritual, in two places, because that's the form of the death 
that's being referred to on the cross. See, Christ died twice on the cross. Now, that doesn't mean he died physically. He was resuscitated and he died again. No, there are, there are several different kinds of death in the Bible. Just one word, death. But the context has to determine whether what kind of death it is. So while he was on the cross, when God the Father poured the sins out on him, what, what kind of death did he die? Spiritual death, because what happened? What, what did the Father do? He turned, back. he turned it back on him. In other words, the idea, the Father separated from the Son. And therein lies the, therein lies the, um, uh, the provision for our salvation. Now, having taken a look at those two verses, I want you to consider some things because I pulled some phrases out, and this is actually what we're learning from that verse. Now, remember, this is truth. This is not religion. This is a spiritual man. Uh, we call him Buffy. He's, he's into exercise and then lifting weights and everything. And when I, every time I went in, I talked to him about his spiritual life, made sure he was saved. He posted something today on Facebook where he said, I am not religious. He said, I am spiritual. Well, that's a, if, he, if he means that, he's making a distinction between spirituality and, and uh, religion, a religious life. So here's what Christ did, verse 7 and 8. Point number one, there are five subpoints. First of all, Christ was born in the likeness of mankind, then why didn't he have an old sin nature? And here's here's the way here's the way you answer that. And and once you get the answer, you it's absolutely imperative that you think. What that means. So while Christ was born in the likeness of mankind, remember he had, there is an inner likeness and an outer likeness. Christ was born in the, like, in the outer likeness of man. So when you looked at him, he had hair, he had eyes, he had lips, he had fingers, he had fingernails, toenails, legs, uh, he had tongue, but he didn't have the same thing on the inside. He had a body, soul, and a spirit, but what was the one thing he didn't have where he was unlike man in the inner, inner, inner life? He didn't have an old sin nature. Now, let me ask you a question, because these are the kind of questions, after all these years, you need to be able to answer when you run into somebody who wants, who wants an answer in this area. Question, why didn't he have an old sin nature? Because he didn't have a human father. That's exactly right. If he'd had a human father, what would he have had? If he'd had an old sin nature in every cell of his body. But see, God the Father had to have a perfect person go to the cross, so he had to be born of a virgin. Now, the, most all of our uh, Christian religions understand that. He was born of a virgin, okay, because he didn't, well, who was the Father? The Holy Spirit was the Father, okay, and... Uh, uh, there came a point in time then, after nine months, uh, Jesus Christ was born. But remember this, uh, and it's, this is imperative. To address every issue of life, and it's especially this idea of abortion. Remember now, when, do, when does a human being become a human being? When? That, that's the that, well. It's the moment. The moment of physical birth is when you are not a human being until you take your first breath. Now, what happens is, is that many people want to make the case that you, while well, this this child in, in utero is able to feel, if you if you touch it, it it moves, uh, it, it it has sensation, but it is not breathing in in utero. Uh, it, if it did, it drowned because it's, uh, it's floating in amniotic fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happens is, it, and when you look back into Genesis and you see that Jesus breathed into, into, into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and he became a human being, okay? So it's not until a person takes their first breath that they are actually a human being. Now what that does is that, that sets the stage for the idea of abortion. 
And what we're indicating is abortion doesn't kill doesn't kill a human being. It kills biological life. So there has to, you may have to make a distinction between there's life there, but it's biological life and it's not human life until the moment of physical birth when the child takes its first breath. So you, uh, what this does then it in, it indicates that you're not murdering somebody when you abort. But the truth of the matter is, what makes abortion what makes abortion wrong? What makes abortion wrong is when people are using abortion as a prophylactic, where you and I are having to pay for the medical services of that abortion, okay? Now, Christ was born in the last kind of two, he was a servant. Now, in other words, once he became a human being, he is now a servant and he's going to be the, uh, he's going to be the servant of God the Father. God the Father sent him on a mission, so he is going to be obedient to God the Father and his plan. Thirdly, verse 7 and 8 say, he was discovered in outward appearance as a man. Now, what we're going to find out here says, well, you know, okay, so he was, he was, um, he was discovered in an out, outward appearance of a man. I'll tell you right now, listen to me, please. When you go out into the public in A grocery store or something, and you see someone coming down the aisle, and the first thing you say to me, is that a man or is that a woman? Mm -hmm. Today, today there are occasions, have you had that experience? Okay, you look at the person, you say, I'm not sure whether that's a man or whether that's a woman. Well, here's the issue. When they saw Jesus, he looked like a man, but let me tell you where it says here. They stripped him naked and put him on the cross, and guess what? When he's hanging there, it was obvious that he was a man. You got that? His genitals were showing. He wasn't a woman. He was a man, and that's what it says here. He was discovering his outward appearance as a man. Otherwise, he made it. Well, look at that long hair and everything. That must be a woman. No, it's no. Look at look look here. Okay. Then it says he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Now, Steve, when you look at that phrase. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. What was the means by which he became obedient? Just a little, no, it's not a trick question now. Read the point, read the verse. See, it's no trick question. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. Okay. So what what was what was the means by which he became obedient? No, no, look at the, I want, I want, I want you to get the answer out of point four. He humbled himself becoming, by becoming obedient. So what was it that, what was it that enabled him to be obedient? What? No, look at the, look. No. What? Humble, that's it. See, look at the word. See, in other words, you, this. What, what's that now? Humble. No, no, that no, that's I'm asking you to read. I'm asking you to read the point. What what does this mean? See, on the point itself, he became he became obedient, and how did he do it? Mm -hmm. It was by humbling himself. Now, someone might say, "Well, what does humble mean?" Okay. So, what I want us to do is understand what it is we're reading. Okay. Now, the next thing we're looking at. Don't think too long now. Um, don't, don't don't overthink. Okay. <laughs> Because I don't want you to miss the next point. See, point five says his obedience then led to his spiritual death on the cross. See, he's going to go to the cross and he's going, he, God the Father. Okay, let me ask you this. At what point, at what point, what time did he go to the cross? What time did they put him on the cross? Do you remember? What's that? Nine o'clock in the morning, 9 a.m. Okay, he was on the cross for three three hours. And what time did he, what time did God the Father start to pour the sins out on him? Well, don't guess. What time did God the Father pour the sins out on him? You're right. What did he, what would you say? 12. 12 noon. So he's on the cross for three hours, and then God the Father began to pour the sins out at 12 o'clock noon. Now, question, how long did it take, how long did God, uh, how long did uh, God stay separated for Jesus? Three hours. What time of the day then would that have been? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. 
So what happened is during that three hour period of time, Jesus is crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We're going to take that up here in just a few minutes. And this is why tonight in this Bible study, I want you to know who this is that you're serving. Who is this that you're looking to? Who is this that you're looking to become exactly like him? Okay. Now, it says his obedience led to his spiritual death. What was his spiritual death? What is spiritual death? No, this said, no, make a distinction between spiritual death and physical death. I'm asking you, what is the spiritual death? Separation from God. That's exactly right. Separation from God. That's it. Now, question. Um, what caused that separation? What? Sin four times, so God separated. Is that it? No, no. Jesus never sinned. So what, what, see, now, isn't it amazing? Paul says, he who knew no sin, see, that's, that's the impeccable Christ. He who knew no sin became sin for us. How did he become sin for us? How did he become sin for us? God imputed it. What? He was imputed with it. And, say imputed? imputed. Okay, he, God the Father imputed, and that's a big word, that he credited Christ's account with all of our sins. That's the pouring out, okay? And as a result of that, God separated, and Jesus is now spiritually dead, okay? And that, where did that take place? Coming up uh, coming up the hill, carrying the cross? No, no, it happened while he was on the cross. That was the location. Now, so he was born in the likeness of mankind. He received the form of a servant. He was discovered in outward appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient, and his obedience led to his spiritual death on the cross. That's verse 7 and 8. Now, let's begin here, and what we want to do is uh, we're, I'm going to, going to dig into this thing. I uh, had no idea that I was going this direction. And as a result of looking at that, looking at that, those, those two verses there, I said, there's got to be more to this, and I began to search, and there it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the sufferings of, of Christ that he that did not begin while he was on the cross. And the sufferings of Christ did not begin on the cross. And we need to realize that, that while he went through this horrible suffering on the cross, that's not where his sufferings actually began. First of all, it's okay. That's okay. That's okay. So here's the issue now. The first point, we're talking, okay, listen now, hang on. We're talking about the sufferings of Christ that did not begin while he's on the cross. Well, that means then somewhere before he got to the cross, Jesus was already suffering. So what we want to do, first of all here, is to look at the, uh, the, uh, look at the agony, the agony of Christ in the garden, okay? And in Luke 20, 22, 44, we're going to read the verse, and here's what it says. Prior to the time of getting to the cross, he went through an agonizing situation in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was in such agony that he sweat, and the sweat that came from his body was, as it were, great drops of blood. So he sweat blood. Have you ever sweat blood? No. Well, you, you, there, there, must be, there must be some horrible circumstances there for someone to be agonized so badly that they're sweating blood. And that's exactly what Christ did. In Luke twenty two forty four. 44, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And I mean, now, what, what was he praying about? He was praying about the fact that he knew he was going to go to the cross. He knew this from eternity past. This was not a surprise. When he was physically realized his, this was his job, okay? He had to go to the cross. So now he's just this side of the cross. He's thinking about this. He's moving toward the cross. He's getting closer in time to the cross. And he's thinking about this so, so much that he goes in the garden to pray and he's praying so fervently about this. Oh, Father, listen, is there any possibility that I don't have to do this? But he says, nevertheless, nevertheless, not my will but thine. So he sweat, his sweat became like drops of blood falling upon the ground. Okay, so that was that was part of the agony. That was part of his suffering 
prior to the time he got to the cross. Okay. Then, then another situation was when, when he was, the, his, his captors captured him and they bound him. They tied him up. Okay. Matthew 27, two says, and they bound him and led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Okay. The third thing that happened to him was in John 18, 22, and this is not, ne not necessarily in any order, but John 18, 22 says they struck him. So not only did they bind him, not only he, did he sweat great drops of blood while he was thinking about going to the cross, they, they struck him and it says, but when he said this, one of the officers who was standing nearby struck Jesus saying, is that the way you're, is that the way you answer the high priest? So what happens, he's standing before the high priest, uh, a, a, an issue came up and Jesus addressed that issue. Well, they didn't like his answer. They didn't like Paul's answer. They didn't like Peter's answer. They didn't like, uh, they didn't like Jeremiah's answer. They didn't like Isaiah's answer. But the truth of the matter is, this officer didn't like Jesus' answer. He said, is that, the way you, is that the way you talk to the queen? Is that the way you talk to the governor? How about that? Is that the way you talk to the prison? So he just reached out and bang, he struck him, okay? Number four, they beat him and mocked him. Now, this is different from the striking here, okay? On another occasion, they beat him and then they mocked him. Luke 22, 63. The men who were holding Jesus in custody began mocking him and beating him. Okay, so these are, these are part of the sufferings before he gets to the cross. There's a fifth one here. What do they do? They blindfold him and they blasphemed him. Luke 22, 64 says, and they, fly, they blindfolded him and repeatedly asked him saying, Prophes prophesy, who is the one who hit you? How about that? See, prophesy, who is the one who hit you? And there were saying many other things against him. What were they doing? Blaspheming him. Okay. The sixth thing that, that happened. Jesus that we serve. This is the Jesus who was back there in eternity past. He was peaceful, peaceful. He was just having a wonderful time in the presence of the Father and the Holy Spirit. Everything was cool. And then God came up with his plan. Say after twisting to uh, after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put this crown of thorns on his head, and put a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, "Hail, King of the Jews!" So, in other words, what happened is they they didn't really believe he was the. Think he of the son. So what did they do? They mocked him by falling down on their knees and mocking him by saying, "Hail, King of the Jews!" So they struck a, uh, a stuck a crown of thorns on his head and then mocked him again. The seventh thing they did before he got to the cross was spit on him, and they're spitting on the Son of God. Matthew twenty seven thirty. It says, "And they spit on him." Now watch this. I took that, the next part of that verse, I actually lined out. It's actually a part of the verse, but what we want is that part of the verse with the front of it that says what? It says, and they spit on the Son of God. Well, the verse says they spit on him. Now, let's look at point number eight. They smote him on the head with a reed. So now I'm going to cross out the first part of that verse, and we're just going to look at the last. And took the reed and beat him on the head. Okay. Then the, point, the ninth thing they did, all of this is before he gets to the cross. Now, you, can you imagine? Um, it just seems like everywhere he turned, they're ridiculing him, beating him, want to put him in prison. So they ridiculed him by bowing down in worship. Now, here again, see, they're, they're mocking him. Oh, yeah, you're supposed to be a king, so what are we going to do? We're going to bow before you. They ridiculed him by bowing down in worship. Mark 15, 19. And they, re and they repeatedly beat his head with a reed and spit on him, and kneeling, they bowed down before him. See, if you, if you read that verse and uh, you say, this doesn't make any sense, goodness gracious, 
They beat him on the head. They spit on him. And then what they do, they, they kneeled and worshiped him. No, see, they were mocking him when they did that. Now, here's an interesting, an interesting point in point number 10. They put a, they put a red. So what happens is in, in certain verses, they translated the Greek into the English as red. In other places, it was purple, okay? Now, what does royalty do? When you, when you, when you see someone that's royalty, what, what, what uh, color does this comes to your mind? Purple, okay? So here's the issue. This red cloak here is actually a purple cloak. So here's what verse nine, uh, one in, in uh, John 19 says. Said, and they stripped him. Now remember that we, we heard earlier that they saw him and they realized this is a man, okay? So they stripped him and put a red cloak on him. Now what happens is, okay, they tear all his clothes off of him. There he is naked. So they throw this red cloak on him. Oh, that's okay. Well, what is all that about? See, in Matthew 27, 28, said that they stripped him again. They take his, take his clothes off him and put a red cloak on him. Matthew, Matthew 19, 1. And now let's try to understand this thing about a red cloak. Okay, what is this red cloak deal? Philo, who was a historian, Philo records a like mockery as practiced upon an idiot at Alexandria. Now, that's the way they wrote it. This, so this idiot, that means somebody who didn't have any sense, okay? They called him an idiot here. They, this is not meant to be uh, um, unkind. They, this was the word that was explaining the fact that this guy didn't have any sense, okay? He wasn't... Wouldn't, he wouldn't, What is it? What's the like mockery? The like mockery is they stripped Jesus and put a red cloak on him. So Philo says, hey, there was something out here that was similar to this. Uh, practice on an idiot at Alexandria who was there made to, to represent Herod Agrippa II. So here's this idiot in Alexandria. They don't like this Herod Agrippa II. And so they're, they're going to treat this idiot like he was like Herod, uh, Herod Agrippa II. And this is found historically in, in, in FLAC, page 980. And here's what it says. It was but too common a practice. Now listen to that. It was but too common a practice to subject condemned prisoners before execution to this kind of outrage. What kind of outrage? Here, the point of the mockery, and see that they, when they put this red cloak, here's this idiot, and they throw this red cloak on him and make it look like he's a king, okay? Well, no, that's not it. This is mocking him. So it was but too uncommon a practice, a common a practice, to subject common, uh, uncondemned prisoners before execution to this kind of outrage. Here, the point of the mockery lays in the fact that their victim, I want you to look at that word victim, what is, what is, interesting about that word victim where question where is that word found in the sentence is it the beginning of the end or in the middle of it in the middle of it okay when do you when do you capitalize a word the first word in the sentence but wait a minute this has capitalized this word victim in the middle of the sentence so why did they do that it was that well, no, not, not if, if if it had been if it had been me, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been that. So why is it why is it why is it capitalized? This is to practice to subject condemned prisoners, but before execution of this outrage, here the point of mockery lays in the fact that their victim and what's in the parentheses? It's Jesus. So what they're, they they capitalize that word victim to indicate they're, they're, they're dealing with deity. You get the idea? So they're recognizing him as deity. So then it says, okay, the mockery lays in the fact that their victim, Jesus, had been condemned as claiming the title of king. So here it is. He's claiming to be king, but they don't believe that. So what are they going to do? They're going to mock him here in just a minute. So they had probably seen or heard of the insults of like kind offered by Herod and his soldiers in Luke 23, 21, and now they reproduced 
them with aggravated cruelty. And what are they going to do? Though he says he's a king, he's nothing really, but let's treat him on, let's throw this red coat, this purple coat over his shoulders, okay? And that was mocking him. So the next bullet point says this. What we're doing is we're learning something about this Christ. We're digging deeper into his life historically. He said, as we, as, as we cannot suppose that Pilate would dress him in a new splendid robe, in other words, uh, Pilate, Pilate is the is the 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 head head of this area, okay? So here he is, he's gonna stand before Pilate, he's gonna be accused, and he's gonna to try to decide, well, what are we gonna do with this guy, okay? So we cannot suppose that Pilate would dress him in a new and splendid robe. Had been, was one that had been worn and cast off as useless and was now used to dress the Son of God as an object of ridicule and scorn. Okay? Scarlet was a color worn by kings and a sign of imperial dignity and therefore put upon Christ by way of mockery, rebuking him with the character he bore as king of the Jews. Now, let me ask you a question. I, I Maybe I shouldn't ask this. I want to know, do you understand what they were doing here? Jesus said he was king. He said he was the Lord. He was the son of God. They said balderdash. No, 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 no. You're no more than just a just a, another human being. You got a bunch of fools out here that are trying to follow you and you're telling you're telling people that you're a king. So what happens is not believe not not believing that he's a king. What they want to do is to mock him, so they stripped him of his clothes, humiliated him by stripping him of his clothes, and then threw this red cloak or this purple cloak on him, treating him as though he were a king. But the truth of the matter is, he was the Lord. He is the Lord. Okay. So all that was all that was mockery, blasphemy. This is a part of the suffering that he went through before he went to the cross. Then number number eleven, what happened? In number eleven, they nailed him to a cross. So imagine just for a moment. Imagine driving nails into your hands, and nails into your feet. John twenty twenty five said. So the other disciples were saying to him, "We have seen the Lord." Now watch this. They've got a handful of a handful of disciples are here. But another one walks up that wasn't with them when the when the larger group saw Jesus, saw him with the nails in his hands, and this other one walks up and says, oh, "Wait a minute, you 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 mean to tell me he was nailed to a cross? He had nails in his hands, nails in his feet." So the disciples were saying to him, "We have the Lord," but he said to them, "Unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails." and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I don't believe they did that. You're telling me they put nails in his hands and he... You tell me, you see it, but until I see it, I'm not gonna believe it. Then point 12, he suffered from thirst on the cross. Now, okay, now this point 12, okay? Suffered from thirst on, thirst on the cross. What are we talking about in these two twelve and these twelve points so far? What is the point we're trying to make? We know he was suffered on the cross, but what's the point we're making here? What is it? Well, he's he's suffering in his humanity, but what is the point? See, it's a time it's a time thing. We're 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 looking. We know he suffered on the cross, but was that the only? That's not where it started. Did it start before? Okay, and that's what we're doing here. We're looking at the at the suffering of Christ long before he went to the cross. Okay, so he suffered from from thirst on the cross in John nineteen twenty eight. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, in order that the scripture would be fulfilled, said, "I am thirsty." Okay, now what we just done here is seen twelve times 12 occasions were in the scripture 
we find him suffering before he ever gets the cross. They spit on him, they hit him, they mock him, they, they strip him of his clothes, etc. Now what we want to do is take a look at suffering related to the cross. And here's what we're going to see here. What we're going to see is three different kinds of Twelve suffering for the cross, twelve occasions. Now we're looking at suffering on the cross, and when we look at him suffering on the cross, what we want to do is look at three different kinds of suffering while he was hanging there. Physical suffering, spiritual suffering, and emotional suffering. Let's take a look at the physical suffering first. There are several paragraphs here, and I'm, we're going to read them and just going to talk about them as we go. So we look at the physical suffering. Now, picturing, he's already on the cross, nailed up there, hands hands nailed, feet nailed. It's understand the details about the cruel nature of crucifixion, since that is how Jesus was put to death. We know from the scripture that he was crucified. But he's not the only person that was ever crucified. He was not the first person that was ever crucified. So what we want to do is to learn something about crucifixion that we might have a better understanding of what he went through at that point in time. So here's the issue. Death by persecution was practiced, was practiced by the Persians. Put the word by in there. Death by crucifixion was practiced by the Persians. So when Jesus was crucified, this is not this is not something that is just brand new. The Persians had been doing this for over 600 years prior to Christ's crucifixion. Now the Greeks then started with the Persians. The Greeks then later practiced uh, crucifixion as well. So the Persians. The Persians were doing it, now the Greeks are doing it. But then, following the Persians and the Greeks, the Romans took it up, okay? But the Romans took it up at an entirely new level. Here's the way the Persians did it. Here's the way the Greeks did it. Now the Ro Romans are doing it, but they're doing it in a, light, in a, 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 a very different way. They reserved, the, the Romans then reserved crucifixion as the form of punishment for the most hardened criminals. Now, okay, if they did this to send a message to the people. And this is the message they were sending. This is what will happen to you if you go against us here in Rome. If you go against our rules, our laws, our way of life, if you do this, here is what you can expect. You'll be on this, on this cross. You'll be the next one. So the Romans actually reserved the crucifixion as a form of punishment for the most hardened criminals. Again, crucifixion sent, sends the message. This is what will happen to you if you go against Rome. But that's why Rome would typically crucify people. Now, where do they do this? They would typically crucify people at a spot where many people would travel. Why were they doing that? As the travels, travelers saw the victims suffer, oh my goodness, uh, Martha, we were going down the road and we looked up there on the hill and look, they got somebody hanging on that thing and he's screaming at, oh, he just, it's horrible, horrible. Well, if you, if you do anything like that, guess what? You're going to be next up there. So that's why Rome would typically crucify people at a spot where many would travel. And as the travelers saw the victims suffer, sometimes for days, when these people were on the cross, they didn't all die suddenly. Sometimes they were on the cross for days. And they would get the explicit warning. People, people are looking at this. They see all this. They're getting the explicit warning. Don't you dare resist Rome. Okay? Now, moving on. Now, now that we've taken take a look at the physical suffering and see how this, how this practice began, 
list. Are we okay? Go ahead and go ahead and change it, Marshall. We're going to change the tape, folks. Thank you, yes, uh -huh. Okay. So the next thing we want to do is to look at the process of crucifixion. How did it take place? Well, the primary materials needed were two individual pieces of wood. Okay. When you take a look, you see that cross and all these pictures. They got a, I got a pieces of wood. Okay. They had needed two individual pieces of wood and three nails. That's all it took. Two pieces of wood and three nails. The two wood pieces would be put together in the now. Watch this. Would be put to, together to form more like a T. So, in other words, when you look at the cross, it would look like this. See, it looked like this. That's the way they put it together to look more like a T rather than a plus sign, like you see it on, in the, in all the pictures out there. Mm -hmm. Rather than a plus sign, as we see pictures indicating, it was like a T, not like a plus. Okay, the cross the cross beam was called um, patibulum. That word is patibulum. That was the name of that. That was the name of the cross beam. Now that's the one that went this way. Then the vertical beam or post was called a stipes. The word that not stipes, it's stipes and patibulum. Okay, and the vertical beam then or post was called stipes. Now the process first involved the victim being flogged with short with short uh, strips. Now watch watch what happens. Listen, what that means is before they put you before they put you on the cross, what they would do is they would flog you. I, one of the most amazing things that I that I had ever seen was at Easter time. The uh, we were in the Philippines, and uh, no, it wasn't the Philippines. No, it was in. It was actually in. Uh, no, I, I'm, I've lost my thought here. It's either it was either in Korea or in the Philippines. I'll have to ask uh, maybe Daryl later and, and see if if this was uh, something that would happen in the Philippines. But it was um, what what would happen is on Easter there was a group of people that would march, and as they were marching, they had it would be men. They would have no shirt on, and they had this handle, wooden handle, with some with some straps on it. Would have some kind of rock or metal inside that inside those strips, and they would they, they, there would be a drum beating, boom, boom. Um, and they're marching toward a, a specific location, and they would take that they would take that whip and they'd go this way, hit themselves here, and those those uh, strips would hit their back, and they take it and go the other way, and they would walk, and by the time they got where they were going, no no skin on the back, bleeding, cut to pieces, and these people were doing this as a ritual, okay. So what we have here then is that uh, before they put these people on the cross, they would take these uh, short strips, these whips with pieces of metal or bone embedded in it and attach them to a solid wooden, wooden ham handle. Okay, the whipping itself would kill a man or leave him permanently crippled. Since it would rip the flesh off the back and off his sides because it would yeah. Like this, okay? It says the victim would then be now. Watch now that you've beat him, you've got no skin on the back, you just cut to pieces. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take that uh, person and force that person to carry the cross beam, okay, through the town toward the place of crucifixion. And that's the cross beam. That's the one that goes up on on the top, okay? They're going to carry it through town toward the place of crucifixion. And that's why that that's that's what carrying one's cross meant. Be prepared to die. It was a one way trip. Crucifixion was a one way trip. No turning back. And in the case of Christ, the flogging in the case of Christ. Now we're talking about his suffering. This is the person that we're saving serving. This is the person who died on the cross that we might have salvation eternally. Sins 
every one of them forgiven. So it was a one-way trip, no turning back. And in the case of Christ, the flogging was so bad, it left him unable to carry his cross for the whole route. Mark chapter 15, verse 21. Now, listen. Now, remember, he is the son of God. Marshall, we have three O's, omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience. That word omnipotence means he's all-powerful. So there is no way that had he tapped into his deity that he would not have been able to carry that cross. But he is in his humanity now, and he's suffering from having been flogged before he started to carry this cross beam, okay? This says in Mark 15, 21, it says, and they compelled a passerby. Okay, so here you are. You're standing there watching this take place, okay? And Jesus is, he's, he's out of strength. He, he can't carry this thing anymore. So you happen to be somewhere along the line, and the Romans said, excuse me, you take this cross and you, you take it. So they compelled a passerby coming from the, coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and what did they command him to do? They commanded him to carry Christ's cross. Now, here's the issue. When the victim came to the place of crucifixion, now that'd be Jesus, or these, these, these people that they're um, murderers and thieves and everything else they're going to crucify, when the victim came to the place of crucifixion, the cross beam would be attached to the top of the vertical beam or post. So what they're, that, that's, the, that's the one that goes on the ground, okay? And the cross beam is what was being carried by Jesus or the people that were going to be crucified. They had the, they had the top of the T. So they would, t- they would do this then. One of, the, one of the beams then would have a hole. One of them would have a hole. You got one of the beams. There are two of them. One of the beams that have a hole and the other had a square peg so that they could be easily attached and detached for subsequent use. So you use these things again and again and again, okay? The assembled cross would then be laid flat on the ground. So, okay, they've got them, they got them together. Now you got the T down there. So now they, now that they have, have it all together, they lay this thing down on the ground and um, lay it down flat would be stripped of all clothing. Now, remember again, they stripped him. They said, hey, we got a man here. This is a man. The victim would then be stripped of all clothing and thus be exposed to more shame, okay? At times, the victim would be given some intoxicating drink to numb the effects of pain. Now, listen to this, please. He'd be giving an intox- they'd give him an intoxicating drink to numb the effects of the pain. You say, well, boy, that's okay. I'm going to crucify me. I'd sure like to have that. But listen, the question is, what was that for? It was not done because of kindness toward the victim. Oh, yeah, he's going to be going to suffer a lot, so let's just give him a drink of something, help knock him out so he doesn't feel the pain so much. No. And darb harder for the soldiers. So the victim then would be placed on the cross. He's laying down now with his bare bleeding back, scraping the wood of the cross. That itself would be excruciating. The victim then would be tied with ropes or nailed, one or the other, tied with ropes or nailed, depending on how long the soldiers would want the suffering to last. Obviously, in Jesus' case, what did they do? They didn't tie him. They nailed him to the cross. In John 20, 24 through 27, the scripture reads this way. But Thomas, one of the twelve, who was called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to Thomas, called Didymus, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas, or Didymus, said to these disciples, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nail." and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace 
be to you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, the one that was the doubting Thomas, he said to Thomas, place your finger here and see my hands. Put it here and see my hands. And take your hand and put it into my side. And do not continue in disbelief, but be a believer. Okay? Now, the victim's hands then would be stretched and nailed on the cross beam. So you got him laying down on that on the vertical beam. They're laying down now. They put his hands on the cross on that cross beam and they start to nail him. The nails would be driven into the wrist, not into the palms, as pictures often portray. They didn't nail them through the palms would not tear away from the flesh and cause the victim to drop the hands. Okay? See if the hands are tear loose, he's nailed he's he that's what's holding up there. Okay. So they they've nailed him through the wrist to hold them on there. Now let, let me ask you this. I could see as as I thought about that. Uh, when I when I when I read this and began to under see, understand how this was done, every, I think every picture I've ever seen had pictures of, of nails in the hands. And I believe I recall somewhere back along the line somebody had told us that it was through the wrist, but I had forgotten about that. But when, if you if you are on that cross and you and your hands come loose, guess what? You're going to go down. You're going to fall off that way. And you only got left holding on there was the nails the nails in the feet on what had happened there probably fought tear loose also but what they did they nailed it through the through the wrists and i'm thinking to myself you can you can you imagine the size of the nails and what that would do when that go when that goes through your wrist well that's what happened that way the nails would won't turn tear away the flesh and cause the victim to drop the hands the third nail there were three nails now one in each one in each wrist, and the third one, you know where that went. The third nail would be driven through both feet. So they get the both feet this way, and they nail through both feet at the junction, at the junction of the feet and the legs. So that would be like through the ankles, okay? So you get them through the wrists and through the ankles. You got three, two two boards and uh and and three nails. That way the feet would be fastened to the vertical beam. That's the one that's going up. The specific crime of the condemned, condemned man then would be written on a board and attached to the cross. That was to let all who would pass by know what crime had gotten that person on that cross. The soldiers then, what are they gonna do? They've got them nailed to the cross now. The soldier then would lift the cross and drop it into a deep hole to keep it vertical. So it's not just digging a little post hole and stick it in there. What happened is I, I can you imagine this now? The, the size of the size of the boards to hold you on there had to be nice big boards. And you, you put the weight of the individual on there, and then you're gonna lift this up and you're gonna drop it in the can you can you imagine they do you think what let me ask you, do you think that when they pick that thing up, you say, now careful now, this is pretty deep. So now make sure make sure it doesn't drop down in there too hard. Can you imagine how just thud, you know, and there you are, ooh, like that. You fall on that thing. So the soldiers would then lift the cross and drop it into a hole, into a deep hole to keep it vertical. Just the jarring, J-A-R-R-I-N-G, just the jarring that would occur with the cross being dropped would bring excruciating pain as though the head would explode. That's exploding with pain. And then would begin the hours and even days of unimaginable and horrendous pain. The forearms would go numb and the shoulders would feel like they're being pulled from their sockets. The chest cavity would be, would be pulled upward and outward making it difficult to exhale in order to draw a breath. And to draw a breath, the victim would distinctly, listen to this and just get the picture of it. Here you are, you're, you're hanging, it's the weight of your body. The weight of your body is pulling on your, on your hands, your arms, and trying to drop down. So if you wanna breathe, your, your chest is, is tight, 
it's pushing on your lungs. And for you to be able to, to get a breath, you've got those nails in your in your feet down there, and you've got to take that and and lift yourself up in order to take a breath. Would, uh, while this would help the victim by instinctively pushing themselves up with their legs, you got those nail that nail in your legs and you're pushing up so you can breathe, and then we go back down again. So, so it would be extremely painful. How so? Because this effort required putting the body's weight on the nails, holding the feet, bending the elbows, and pulling upward on the nails, driven through the wrists. It would also cause tremendous pain in the nerves. Pain like as though one was going through a fire. And with each breath, the victim, Jesus, the victim's back. So what happens now, you're hanging on that board, and now you raise yourself up to take a breath. Watch this. You raise yourself up, and then when you let go, down you come, and you're back, scraping that, scraping that that board that you're, you're attached to. The victim would then arch his back for relief. The constant cope with the pain in the arms, the chest, the back, and the legs. And in the meantime, the will to survive, the will to survive would keep the victim crying out in pain. And that would continue until he became completely exhausted, too dehydrated, and too physically weak to pull in another breath. What was the result? Death, which would eventually occur hours later or even days later, usually coming by what? Coming by suffocation, not necessarily. We die through blood loss, which is a common understanding by most people. So that's a glimpse of the physical suffering of our Lord and what he went through for your sins and mine. Stop and listen to that again. This is a glimpse of the physical suffering, just physical suffering that our Lord went through for your sins and mine. From the physical aspect of his sufferings, let's look at a second aspect of Jesus' suffering and we're going to talk about the spiritual suffering now. We, we look, look to the physical suffering. As the physical suffering was and genuinely dreadful, this spiritual suffering, well, not physical, but spiritual, this spiritual suffering was much harder for our Lord. Why? Why would that be? Is because on the cross, Jesus express, experienced the psychological, uh, 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 yes, the psychological pain while he was on the for all of our sin. Now that was that was written by Grudem, uh, who was a systematic theology uh, professor, and um, this was written on page five seventy three of his book. What did he say? Because of the cross, Jesus experienced the psychological pain of bearing the, the guilt for all of our sins. There are times even when we experience the feeling of tremendous guilt when we realize we have sinned. Stop and think about that. Okay, so you've done something wrong. And you sense within yourself a guilt for having done that. Well, the weight of the guilt is heavy in your heart. And we're sinners to begin with. And if our Lord Jesus Christ, who never sinned. He was perfectly holy while he lived on earth. No sinful words, no sinful actions, not even one wicked thought. He hated sin, and even the very thought of sin caused him to rebel against it instinctively. Yet all he hated, all the, all that was not him, was poor, now listen to that, all that he would have hated, was poured fully on him. Everything he disliked was poured out on him. In other words, all of our sins were fully poured out on him. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that your sins, my sins, our sins were poured out on Christ. 
nothing left. In Isaiah 53, 6, Lord has laid on him, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So God the Father is laying all the sins of the world on Christ. In Isaiah 53, 12, he bore the sin. The Lamb of God, that's Jesus, who takes away the sin of the world. How? By paying the price, the penalty for our sins while he's on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him, that is Jesus, that's God the Father, made Christ, who had no sin to be sin, or better translated, a sin offering for us. That's the verse that I quoted a little while ago. Hebrews 9, 28. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. 1 Peter 2, 24. By the way, before I get to this last one, the thought just went through my mind. If there's anybody out there that could, could possibly believe that there's something you could do for your salvation after this has occurred, what kind of thinking is that? It ought to be pretty clear that there's no way that you could add anything to what Christ has already done. So all you have to do is to believe what he had done Believe in his death, his burial, his resurrection, and guess what? You are saved for an eternity. First Peter 2, 24. He himself, meaning Jesus, bore our sins. How? What did it mean, bore them? Bore on them, bore those sins. God the Father poured them out on them. God the Father credited his account with our sins. He bore our sins in his own body. Now watch this. He bore it in his body. Question. Did the deity of, deity of Jesus have a body? No, the deity of Jesus was invisible. Therefore, what this is indicating to it to us is that when he did this, he did it in his humanity. It was it was in his physical body. He was on that cross. Now, what happened is this the Isaiah 53, 6 and 12, the John passage, 2 Corinthians and Hebrews, and 1 Peter, these ver verses don't mean that Christ became a sinner on the cross. No, he didn't become a sinner. He never was guilty of committing any sin. Look at John 8, 46. Which one of you convicts me of sin? <laughs> Which one of you convicts me of sin? He said, if I speak truth, why do you not believe me? 1 Peter 2, 22. He who committed no sin, nor was, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. He was being treated as though he committed sins, though. See, that's what they were doing. They were treating him as though he just like everybody else. See, uh, Steve, this is why, why when we look at him, he, he was made in the likeness of humanity, but it's the outer likeness. He didn't have the old sin nature, so he's not going to do like we do. He is being treated as though he committed those sins, thus bearing the punishment. And as a result, all who put their faith in him could be forgiven of their sins. That's you, that's me. Because of what he's done, all you have to do is to put your faith in him. That means you believe in what he was doing. Now, let me ask you this: Take a look at take a look at your life and how you've grown up. I grew up and I I grew up related to. I didn't wasn't wasn't there very much, but I was associated with a particular Protestant uh, denomination. My wife was associated with that same denomination. You growing up, you were related with some possibly with some denomination. W whatever it is, it might be the Baptist, the Methodist. The That will be able to give you any kind of forgiveness. All you have to do is to believe. The moment you believe in Jesus, God the Father forgives you of every sin that you've committed up to that point in your life. So if you're 50, 50 years old and become a Christian or 60 years old and become a Christian, every time you sinned up to that point in time, the moment you believe, those are all wiped away. They're gone. They're gone. If you become a born-again Christian at age six, and don't get any doctrine, you're going to continue to sin. But those sins were already paid for back there. God sees what you did, what you did before you were saved. He sees what you've done since you were saved. And you're going to see everything you do up until the time you die. And he sees that with every human being. Jesus himself said that he, 
the Son of Man did not come to be served. No, he didn't come to he didn't come to plant. He said, "Oh my goodness, Lord, let me let me uh, let me let me wash your feet. Uh, let me let me do your let me do your clothes there. Let me wash your clothes for you. Uh, let me. I don't like the way your hair is cut right there. Let me take that, take a, Can I shave you, Lord? No, listen. He, he, he said he didn't come. He didn't come to serve. He said he came to give his life a ransom for many. Question: If he came to give his life a ransom. You're going to pay for something. How many are the many? 90 out of 100? He says, it says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. My question is, how many are many? A human being. He's already paid the penalty for people who haven't even been born. And guess what? If they live 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, God the Father knew in eternity past how many sins they'd be committing. And all those were cast upon Jesus at that point in time. So uh, in Matthew, Matthew 20, 28, we just read that. Again, ransom refers to the price, the, to pay the price. Ransom refers to pay the price. And what was the price for your sins? It was the place was one of those areas where when you read something, oh yeah, I understand what blood is. So Jesus paid for my sins through his blood. No, it's not his literal blood. This blood, the, the phrase, the blood of Christ refers to his spiritual death. So if I said to you, if I said to you, Cody, uh, the blood of Christ, what are we thinking about? Are we thinking about his physical blood? Or are we thinking about what he did on what he did on the cross? That's right. That three hours of separation, that's the meaning of the blood of Christ, okay? That's redemption in that's redemption terminology. And by shedding his blood on the cross, that's his spiritual death, Jesus not only bore the guilt of our sin, see, he bore the guilt. God looked at you, you're a sinner, he says, guilty. Remember, Jesus took your IOU. I owe you absolute righteousness, God, and I cannot pay. Jesus said, give me that thing. He said, I pay it, I put it on the cross. He said, your, 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 uh, your, uh, the charge against you has been taken care of. It's been paid in full, okay? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, Christ is, atone, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. God, God, the Father, God the Father presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. He's the one who paid the penalty. How did he do it? Through the shedding of his blood. That's That again, that's the spiritual death of Christ. To be received by faith. How do you receive your salvation? You receive it by faith. So, and by absorbing God's wrath for sins on the cross, Jesus Christ is absorbing the wrath of God. Well, God doesn't have any wrath. That's just the righteousness of justice of God working out. The righteousness of God sees your sin. He can't do anything. He can't do anything. So when 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 uh, God is cursing you because of your sin, that's that's the wrath of God. Discipline is the wrath of God. Okay. So by absorbing God's wrath of, for for sins on the cross, Jesus made the provision that those who would trust in him, that is, those who would put their faith in him, will never experience God's wrath for their sins. You will not face one sin at the beam of seat of the great white throne judgment. Never. Sin is not an issue for you anymore. So that's a glimpse at the spiritual suffering Jesus went through on the cross for your sins and mine. So I'm going to say to you right now, make sure that you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to know that you're going to heaven when you die, not go to hell in the lake of fire, eternally separated from God. No, you don't need to do that. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, knowing that he died, was buried, and resurrected on your behalf, you are saved for eternity. Why don't you believe it? Why don't you believe it? 
Now, there's one other suffering, and that's the emotional suffering. And I indicated to you, this might go a little longer because I wanted to finish the whole thing. Don't want to separate this till next Sunday. Here's the emotional suffering. Physical suffering, spiritual suffering, emotional suffering. By emotional suffering, I'm referring to the sense of abandonment that Jesus experienced on the cross. Everyone abandoned him. We okay? Yes. We were looking at a tape. Everyone abandoned him. Imagine if you're going through a tough time in life. You're going through a tough time in life. Would you rather be alone, abandoned by your spouse, abandoned by your children, or even your friends? Or would you rather have someone alongside? Well, the answer ought to be obvious. Even one person close is such a blessing during times of great trial. Yet Jesus was left all alone during the time of the greatest suffering anyone could ever undergo. First of all, he already must have felt the pain of Judas's betrayal, and the 11 who promised to be with him abandoned him when he was arrested. And second, he faced the great abandoned him on the cross as Jesus bore our sins, the perfect fellowship, not, listen, this is an interesting thing. Make this distinction. Jesus did not lose his relationship with the Father when they were separated. It was the fellowship that was that was lost. That's like with you and I. We can't lose our relationship with God, but we can lose the fellowship, and that's what happened with Jesus. It was the relationship, the fellowship that was lost between the Father and the Son. A fellowship that existed in eter all eternity before this time was temporarily broken, especially between noon and 3 p.m. It was the In fact, that emotional suffering was so great, which caused Jesus to cry out that very familiar cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now listen. Remember, get the picture. That statement right there is absolutely fantastic when you understand it. Jesus was deity. God the Father is deity. Jesus Christ was the Son of God the Father. God the Father was the Father. That's as far as the, the relationship was concerned, uh, not, uh, not, not physically, but he was the leader. So you've got God the Father and God the Son. And what happened is, in the family, in the family, you call your father the father, okay? So what happened when the relation, when the fellowship was broken, when fellowship was broken, he didn't recognize the father as deity, uh, as, as his father, as relationship, family. He, really, he just recognized him as deity. So the family thing was sort of broken. And he's, he sees, my God, my God, recognizing the father as deity, but remember, when, when it was all over, what did he say? Father, into thy hands I come in my spirit. So that, that fellowship was back again after he had paid the penalty for the sins. So when we read those words, my God, my God, when you read those words, we can't, we can't get just a little glimpse of how deep the pain and emotional anguish Jesus suffered for your sins and mine, realizing that the fellowship between the persons of the Godhead was broken because of you and me. Now, just take just take your how many times when when a family member dies at the moment they die that separation and the pain that people are feeling, okay, and the, and the suffering that they go through. This is Jesus doing the same thing here, but it's for our sins. So we see the physical, spiritual, and emotional suffering that Jesus went through. Now let's do this for reflection. Just let's reflect for just a moment. The next. Paul, on the physical, spiritual, and emotional suffering of Jesus Christ that he went through on the cross as he shed his blood to redeem us, to pay for our sins, okay? that got a typo there. And may, the, and may that reflection, when you're thinking about what Christ did, may that reflection compel you to say no to that temptation to sin. Can we look at the cross? knowing our Savior hung between heaven and earth, crying out in a profound agony, at the same time 
cherish the sins, including the very sins we have loved for so long. Unthinkable. May our hearts be moved with holy resolve from this day forward to grow He will tell us to put them away knowing what it did to our Savior. And may our hearts also be stirred up to love and treasure our precious Lord Jesus even more. Interpretive translation of verse 8. In fact, although having been discovered in outward appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of spiritual death, that is the spiritual death of the cross. This code right there and Christ of this world, the pastors and teachers and evangelists and the Christians to give witness to many who come uh, have become born again. Yes, Father, we treat that pivot point, that remnant born again believers, all in America, around the time for the return, Father, to what we can comprehend. Thank you, Father, for this visit, this realization, this realization, this point of salvation. It means so much to us every day. Motivate us to live the Christ like a mm. Christ centered life. Jesus, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you so much, folks. I uh, thank all of you who are being online with us tonight. Um, thank you for listening to this, this passage of Scripture. God bless you all. And uh, we'll see you again this coming Sunday morning. Good day.